Good morning and welcome to the side of the show. I'm Ini John Mekwa and this is Business Morning on Sunrise Daily. We start normally from the global space and that's where we're beginning today with oil prices which traded low on Tuesday as investors await key U.S. and China CPI data that's expected on Wednesday as well as the outcome of the Federal Reserve's policy meeting to clear uh, to present a clearer picture of where inflation is heading and how that will affect feel the man. We're taking a look at the numbers, we see a drop in both uh, uh, commodities that's for the Brent and WTI even though we see it's much higher than what we had yesterday. Yesterday about this time Brent was about $79. This morning it's up to $81.50 but it has dropped 0.16%. WTI is still around hovering around the $77.67 $77. and it's down 0.04. Prices climbed about 3% to a one week high yesterday Monday buoyed by expectations that nothing hemisphere summer vacation season will boost fuel demand this summer again some analysts say will likely be short-lived given the prospects of higher interest rates are still being there the release of those data from the united states and china are, are being expected on wednesday and will certainly determine the direction in the next couple of days then we come home to Nigeria, looking at what uh, happened to the Naira yesterday. Nafex appreciated against the dollar. That's it, right there. It was a 0.02% uh, appreciation, very marginal, but appreciation anyway. So we see it opened at 1,481 Naira, 32 Kobo, and then close at three cover that's the difference just in the cover but i mean to give some sign of stability for nothing which is the most active major market for fx it's closed at 1483 naira 62 cover uh not as much as on nafx but still within the range it's been keeping and the change there also very marginal zero point zero two percent a bit of stability going on in the market uh, for just a couple of days now late last week up to this time uh, giving a bit of encouragement uh, that perhaps we have found maybe not a very good level but at least a stable level for the naira at this time then yesterday again, uh, fuck, they did uh, share some funds to the three chairs of government. They received a total of 1.143. A worry here, for last month, it was 2.1 trillion naira that was shared. We talked about that yesterday, you know, trying to find out how states can accommodate the demands of the union, uh, the workers' union. But for the, for the month of May, we see that that dropped, dropped to one point. One a worrying one. I hope we can get some answers to that. Federal government got 365.81 billion naira. Uh, states got 388.42 billion naira. And now you notice that there was that change. So we see states getting more than the federal government because they should have more responsibilities. That's why we're happy, you know, down at them at this time. And if they say they cannot pay 60,000 naira, then can they cut down the expenses added to this? and be able to accommodate what uh, labor is asking for. Local councils got 282 billion naira, and then of course you have those um, states uh, who give uh, major, the major source of, of uh, foreign exchange to the country, uh, they get 13% of mineral derivatives, uh, 106.5, and they got, that's what they got for the month of may of course we'll be referring to this uh, late hour on today and i'm um, talking about that uh, the issue of minimum wage obviously still in the front burner that's why we're drilling on the states to see what they get and how they can meet up with what labor is demanding and labor has said that they will not take 62,000 naira. the meeting has ended as of the tripartite committee has ended and now it's been given to the secretary of the federation to take it to the executive, of course, led by the president, we await what will happen. We do hope we'll not go on strike, but Labour is insisting no 62,000 naira as minimum wage. We have never contemplated 100,000, talk less of 62,000. We have never contemplated that. We are still at 250,000. That is where we are. And that is what we consider a North concession to the government and the other social partners in this particular situation. For example, if they stop paying their past governors and deputy governors pension while they sit at National Assembly, they will have more money to pay. If they reduce the cost of governance in their respective states, they will be able to pay. We have given the federal government a one-week um, uh, notice to look at the issues, and that one week expires tomorrow. If after tomorrow, we have not seen any tangible response from the federal government. The organs of the uh, organized level, we meet. The relevant organs will meet to decide on what next. 
Sanyeka was a guest on our sister program Morning Brief yesterday. So that's tomorrow he's talking about actually means today. So I think uh, everybody in Nigeria, we're holding our breath to see what will come out of this. What will the president do come midnight today? Will the lights go off again? Will the airports be shut? Will offices be shut? Banks and all of that. Will we see that? And we know what it costs the country. Perhaps we should discuss how the states can meet up with this. I mean, uh, the, the unions have said they won't even take 60,000 naira, but even state governments are saying they can't even afford 60,000 naira. But we want to ask, can they really not afford it? Um, we heard what uh, Mr. Yika said there from the trade union, giving some suggestions. Perhaps if they cut some of those um, expenses, they could be able to meet up. But let's speak to somebody who is very good with the numbers and has done a lot of research into the numbers, spendings of government. The Chief Executive Officer of Budgets, uh, Mr. Sean Igmide, joins us virtually. Mr. Igmide, good morning, and thank you for joining us this morning. It's a pleasure being here today. Thank you so much for inviting me. Great. Yeah. I'm, I'm sure you heard Mr. Onyeka uh, suggesting perhaps if the states will cut some of those, uh, the security votes, there's a uh, pension to pass governors and uh, changing of their cars and things like that. Perhaps the state will be able to pay maybe the 250,000 Naira that labor unions are asking for. W what are your thoughts on this? Um, it's a fair argument to have. And I think it's also because uh, we have always insisted that public office holders should show example examples of probity, examples of integrity uh, when it comes to use of public resources. Uh, everybody is seeing that the governors or the president or the entire apparatus of government have not acted like we are in any austere situation. Um, they have not acted as if we are in a challenging fiscal environment. So um, people, the, law, the workers also want a piece of that. You also want that uh, decent lifestyle. It's very obvious that 30,000, 60,000, all of that is not enough to subsist, to exist properly in this uh, economy. So uh, I feel like 250,000 might be a bit far-fetched, uh, considering the current status of the finances of states. I wonder if we know that states are getting more money um, from the... Uh, uh, FAC, which is, uh, has doubled in recent times, but also uh, capital expenditure cost has doubled. The amount you used to build a road um, two years ago is not the same amount you used to build the same road this time again. So in the very, but I think that 100,000 federal government could do a little bit more than that. And also, I think this minimum wage situation also should be on the tier structure. We also are aware that cost of living across the country is not the same. In Shokoto and Lagos, the cost of living is not the same. And in terms of accommodation, in terms of food, in terms of even transport, so the, the cost of living differs. So I think it's also a time to a bit of data and rigor to say, these are the three tiers in, that we're going to put cost of living. Um, and we're going to say this should be the minimum wage across this bracket. But I think the federal government should do far better than what it's doing right now. Um, if the federal government is saying the uh, 450 billion thousand um, uh, minimum, which is going to bring its weight between 9.5 trillion, um, I don't think there's a problem if they can do something around 150,000 in my own view. I think that should be a fair place where um, the minimum which should be uh, uh, if, if uh, you are looking at it. Mr. Nugede, the state governments are saying they cannot even afford. 60,000, and you're saying 150,000. How do you see them uh, being able, even at 30,000, we do know some states are still owing. I mean, I, I, I will make that guess for the federal government at 150,000. I think the federal government can afford 150,000 if it chooses to apply capital efficiency, if it makes some goals of right to apply some of right controls if it shrinks the cost of governance, especially at the federal level, and focus on what exactly is right. I think at the state level, we have to build a tier structure. Some might pay 120, some might pay 100, some might pay 80. So we could build a tier structure at that level. I think the argument that 30,000 is what the state can afford, I don't think, I think that is too low, irrespective of any state. Um, there's a need to prioritize work. And it's also a time to have bigger questions of productivity. Um, what's the size of your workforce? And uh, did 
Is that what exactly you need? And what is the quality of the output from those workforce? So as the state governments are having this conversation on, on the minimum wage, they should also have conversation with labor on productivity. So if I don't need five people, uh, and I, then I just need two people there, then I know that I have two people, two well-paid people there. We all know that the whole corruption within the civil service, all of that is linked with corporate structure. I mean, budget brought out the data out yesterday. The highest paid person in the civil service is around 517,000 naira. You know, um, as, as a director level. I mean, let's be honest with ourselves. We have directors with children in the UK, in the US, and, and in luxurious lifestyles. I mean, so is that from that salary that they begin to get, that they enjoy those kind of luxury? So, you know, sort of, we, we must pay people what is decent. Um, and the end of the day, now put punitive systems to check corruption and to check abuse. So I believe that the 60 to 80,000. Um, Naira minimum, I feel like a whole lot of states with the size of the population, with the size of their workforce, can't afford that. Um, and I think the federal government should take the higher end of the bargain, maybe at, at around 50,000. All right. And, and you talked about the issue of productivity. And I know that uh, Budget did, uh, you did some research into the issue of ghost workers um, uh, some time ago. And you did find that they're actually ghost workers. Uh, right. And obviously, this increases the expenses of the state government. Talking about efficiency, these are the top, the top five. From, this is from your number, Ms. Onigmide. Aquaibom uh, had 2,713. Uh, uh, Kano, up to 4,000. Jigawa, Kwara, Sokoto. And I'm not sure these things have been eliminated at this time. Obviously, this is feeding into the cost of operations of every state and, you know, denying requests, genuine requests that could have been met. Yeah, I mean, this report was uh, sourced from CIFTAS. That was a World Bank-funded project on fiscal governance across states. Um, and after some biometric assessment and review, um, the states reported that this number of people have been taken off the payroll. Uh, we know that this problem still exists across many states. Um, and as much as we have good work, we also have productive workers. I mean, a few of us have also, been, have also gone through the public service in terms of I was a student, I went to a public secondary school, you know, and I knew a lot of times you, you struggle with people, are people really committed to their work. Um, so maybe this is another chance for the government to do another biometric assessment, a holistic one to be said that the people that they pay, I mean, there are a lot of mechanisms to define that. You have the name, you have BVN, so you could easily cross-reference that to the ritually define we should work uh, within your state. And the second level, beyond that, is now think of um, who are the productive workforce. I mean, are they effective enough? And it might be time to, also it might be ultimately time to, you know, the federal government and the states I've been returning back of a fact allocation. This might be the time for their conversation to make one off payments. I mean, significant one off payment to those who the federal government and state level feel that they are unproductive enough. And so that you have a much more lean workforce uh, and you have a workforce that is also well compensated. That's the only way you can get productivity up, in my own view. And also, you also have to look at cost of governance, your perception by us. Even though we know some of these numbers might not be enough, we, we wage bill of around $5 billion on a monthly basis it does not compare to spending maybe a billion or 1.5 billion on buying cars. But it also resets the perception. If people in public office are in the life of luxury, the people, workers also want the same too. So it's also important that the government also reflects and adopt a more Spartan lifestyle so that at least everybody knows that we are in all of this together uh, as much as possible. All right, uh, Mr. Ningbide, this is obviously an ongoing uh, conversation and we are counting down to midnight tonight, hoping that the lights won't go off. And I know you're hoping, <laughs> hoping that soon. Well, thank you so much, Executive Office of Budgets, for your time this morning. All right, let's take a break. When we come back, uh, we'll continue along this line, but maybe from a different perspective with Mr. Bismarck Rwani after the break. Just stay with us.
Welcome back to watching Business Morning on Sunrise Daily right here on Channel Television. We head to the commodity space now with the Chief Executive Officer of Financial Derivatives Company, Mr. Bismarck Rowani. Mr. Rowani, good morning and thank you for joining us. Good morning and thanks for having me. Yeah, so first of all, a worrying matter, a FAQ was released yesterday for the month of May and we saw a drop from 2.1 trillion naira in April to 1.143. That is worrying, especially at a time when we are talking about minimum wage and we want the states to do even more. Well, that's, uh, that's a disturbing trend because the average uh, fraction in the last six months has been infinitely higher than what it was. Coming down to 1.1 or 1.2 trillion naira this month is quite disturbing because it means the revenue uh, that we thought we had actually uh, brought in has actually uh, come under control, it's actually falling again. That is dangerous and when you talk about affordability and sustainability when you are talking about minimum wage. So one has to look at it and see exactly what is going on. But it's not far-fetched. One, in that uh, companies have been declaring losses due to forest losses and therefore you, only, you can only tax profits. Oil production has fallen and so the petroleum profit tax are actually gone. And thirdly, the contribution of NMPC to the uh, consolidated fund has actually dropped. So when you put all of this in together, and you know you now begin to see the threat to macroeconomic stability when when revenue, we, which we thought we had we had put under control, is falling and growth itself is not rising. So on two fronts, the growth equation and the revenue equation, Nigeria is beginning to fall behind. That is that is a very dangerous place to be at this point in time. Yeah, obviously, because uh, we could hear states saying, um, yes, they got uh, um, 388.42, which is obviously not up to what they had. And we're looking for how they can free up funds, you know, to be able to meet up with the demands of labor. I mean, this could, this could be another hindrance. Yes, it is, because the, the way to look at it, uh, it's not just in a question of affordability. When, once you increase wages, and there's no increase in productivity, it becomes inflationary. And the inflation factor, which is key, when you have inflation today that uh, we are projecting that it's going to come in at about 34.32. If any inflation above 12% is considered growth retarded, inflation above 18 or 20% is actually debilitating. And inflation above 30% could be actually destructive to value and output. So these are the things that we have to take into consideration uh, when analyzing the situation we're in. So one, we are, we are in a very difficult spot in terms of time of negotiation, cost of living crisis, a currency in, in, in turbulence. And at the same time, we are trying to create consensus, political consensus in the arrangement that will make this country work smoothly. And talking of inflation, FDC sees an increase of 0.63% for the month of May to 34.32. So, um, I mean, this obviously <laughs> is going to fit into the questions or the requests of the unions again. I think inflation has more to do, you know, has, you know, inflation really uh, is partly uh, an issue that comes in minimum wage negotiation, but inflation as a factor uh, erodes income, erodes purchasing power. It makes a country less competitive and also you know, be, begins to undermine confidence of investors. So I, I don't, let us not take inflation as a seasonal affair, which has to do mainly and only with the, uh, the minimum wage discussion. It is, when you look at it, what we saw in the last month or two was the inflation beginning to moderate. In, in other words, the pace of growth of inflation, increase in inflation has started to slow down. But now, guess what? The stocking factors, money supply growth is back up uh, above 73%. Currency in circulation has also increased. Uh, the price of diesel has gone up to 1,200. The exchange rate is a, a little bit stable, uh, but not, not totally under control. So when you put all these factors together, it makes us fear that our projection that inflation begins to moderate in July, August is not, it's not going to happen. Therefore, we think that inflation moderation is going to start taking place later in the year, if so, anything. However, this month, we have the Ramadan uh, thing, uh, Ramadan 
uh, festival this month. And you can see that the price of a ram, I understand in term markets, as high as 300,000 naira. This was something that was going for about almost 70,000 a year ago. So we are, we are, we are in dire straits, actually, to be honest with you. Mm, so, I mean, I, I'm, I'm looking at this uh, currency in circulation rising by over 1%. I think we have it right here. Currency in circulation by 1.07% to 3.97 from 3.92. And I'm thinking, but the, the federal government has been very aggressive, mopping up money in circulation um, through the uh, securities. Uh, or, is, or doesn't it fit in? Well, I think we should differentiate between currency in circulation and money supply. Currency in circulation is cash. That is, you know, you have 1,500 naira notes, 200 naira notes. That is one thing. But it comes, it, you know, it comes to about almost 3.9 trillion naira. But money supply itself, the broad money supply itself, is 96.97 trillion. That is what, that is what is disturbing. It increased by 73%. This the money supply growth was actually 69% last month, and it has now gone to 73%. Once money supply increases, you are bound to see a higher level of inflation. So that's a dangerous sign, and we need to bring that in. Uh, this is after the MPC had increased interest rates by 1.5%. Uh, you know, but you see, money supply itself is a function of the fiscal deficit, the... Um, spending by, by the government or extraordinary spending. So when you put all those things together, you need to, you have to have a holistic approach to bring all these things under control. If not, what is going to happen is that whilst you are, whilst you're actually controlling one, one variable, others are running away from you and begin to pull you back. And that is why today we have difficulty when you look at food inflation, look at core inflation, look at urban inflation, and look at non-food inflation, the non-food basket. All of these variables are pointing towards some difficulty, in, including month-on-month -month inflation, which, which actually declined last time. So we are, uh, we are in a precarious uh, situation right now, and it calls for all hands being on deck to ensure that we can bring, every, you know, bring this in under control. Failure to bring inflation under control over an extended period could be not only economically debilitating, but also can create political instability if you're not careful. Mm, so, Mr. Rani, do you see this pointing to that um, question or conversation about more coordination between the fiscal and the monetary authorities? Fine, we've been seeing the hike in interest rates. And as at last month, we were, you know, trying to be happy by seeing that the rate of increase is uh, reducing. But I mean, if yeah. this actually, if your projection comes on, uh, it means that uh, perhaps the hike in interest rate is not doing as much as we thought it should be doing. Yeah, it, there, there are limitations to monetary policy tools in terms of controlling inflation because inflation has many, many factors that actually push it. So, you, you know, you have things like exchange rate uh, depreciation, you have uh, output uh, constraints, you have logistics costs, you have the price of diesel, you have the price of car gas and but more than anything else it is the um, the instatable amount of spending federal government spending not just uh, legislators spending and all that but spending not just federal government state government spending spending generally without an increase in a corresponding increase in productivity can be can be a stocking factor for inflation so and also we are looking at historical inflation Inflation expectations as we go on, as we go towards the end of second half of the year, when people now begin to position themselves for Christmas spending and other things, you will now begin to see that which can act, those things that can undermine productivity and also begin to uh, push the uh, inflation moderation expectations uh, out, out further, further, further up front. No, sorry further out. So what we need to do is that in discussing this minimum wage review, right, and don't forget there's a big difference between minimum wage review and general wage review. What we are talking about is minimum wage law. We should, policymakers must consider the wider implications of this 
increase in wages without a corresponding increase in productivity. And the fiscal stimulus package, which is going to, which is being announced right now, which is also supposed to soothe and act as a um, social safety net for the, the vulnerable people in society. So there are so many things that, so many uh, balls flying in the air, uh, jugg juggling it, right? So the federal government of Nigeria, money policy, the, the investment policy makers, and the fiscal policy makers uh, need to have a coordination, you know, need to coordinate these things very quickly. And one, one doubts false expectations. There are a lot of people who have, who have expectations that the country is very rich and that the mm. country can afford it. We need yeah. to control the ostentatious spending that we are seeing around the place so that people sacrifice can be shared equally across various various strata of society because that is a major issue when you cannot see people living ostentatiously and lavishly on one hand and on the other hand you're asking people to make sacrifices mm, so yeah this that is that is where <clears throat> this whole idea of leadership leadership and coordination of the activities of the government so that we're sending out the right signals yes. and anchoring expectations rightly. I think that is the key issue now. All right, Mr. Rwania, I think it goes back to what you said some time ago, that the government needs to tell the people the truth. And if people know there's the truth, then they'll know what to sacrifice. But thank you so much, Chief Executive Officer. Truth, truth, is, in short, truth is in short supply right now. <laughs> Yeah. Um, Chief Executive Officer of Financial Derivatives Company, thank you so much for your thoughts this morning. All right, now um, we need to head back to the Sunrise Daily Studios. I, I just have time to tell you that the All Share Index yesterday at Nigeria's uh, stock market was positive at the close of trade, 0.58% in the positive. And uh, yes, you do have it there, but we don't really have time. And the market gained 324 billion naira. So it's a good one. But you get uh, intraday numbers uh, during 1 p.m. Our 1 p.m. program has been incorporated. You don't want to miss it. Ladi Williams will be here with Anity Edet. I'll head you back. Let's head back now to the Sunrise Daily Studios. <laughs>